Okay, so welcome back uh, to our third live lecture in Math 2421. Um, I know that last week I posted some videos from my previous uh, semesters of teaching this course, but I'm still going to cover some of those topics today before moving on. So even if you didn't get a chance to watch those, I'm going to have a brief overview of all of them. And in doing so, I'm going to split this recording into probably three separate recordings. I'm going to cover topic one. We're going to take a break and then cover topic two, take another break, and then I'll cover topic three. And that's how today's lecture will go. Okay, so um, in the first part of today's three lectures, in the first lecture of today's three lectures, uh, we're going to cover something called the squeeze theorem. This is a, a rather famous theorem in calculus one courses for evaluating limits that you cannot evaluate analytically, like just plugging in. And here's the statement. Theorem. So if h of x is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to g of x, for all x in some open interval. Except possibly at C, some real value C, then the limit as X approaches C of H of X equals L equals the limit as x approaches c of g of x implies that um, the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists and also equals f. Okay, so what, what this is saying is that, okay, if we can bound a function from below and above by two functions that we know on some open interval, and we know that these two functions converge to the same limit as x approaches c, then we immediately know the value of the limit as x approaches c for the middle function, f. So, for example, Graphically, maybe I'll look at like H, or maybe I'll look at F first. So like um, F might look like this. So this is like F. And we're concerned about limiting behavior as F approaches C. And for whatever reason, we might not be able to see it. If there are functions that we know, this could be like G. And suppose we know another function. Oh, no, that would be H, sorry. And we know another function. Call it G. Notice that F is squeezed. It's blurry. So in this picture, notice that the function F, shown in red, is squeezed in between H and G. Okay. And we, for maybe we know H and G converge to some L. In this case, it must be that F also converges to L. And so that's the general idea. And I think it's best illustrated with a, a solid example. 
finds limit as x approaches zero of x times sine of one over x. Okay. Now we can't just evaluate this function at x equals to zero. So we can't solve this analytically, right? If we plug in zero, we get zero times sine of one over zero. That's not defined. So when considering this limit, maybe we can bound it from above and from below. Okay. So let's consider how we might do that. If we can bound it from above and below by functions that we know the limit as x approaches zero and they like equal each other, then we know the limit of this one according to the squeeze theorem. So recall that sine, right? The sine function, no matter what you put in there, right? The sine function is always bounded above by what number? What's the largest sine can be? Sign of any value, what's the largest it can be? One. Exactly, right? Sign is at most one. And what's the smallest sign can be? Zero. What about what's sign of um, three pi over two? Your call sign looks like this. So here's one right there. What's that value right there? Negative one. Negative one, right? So recall that negative one is less than or equal to sine of whatever, one over x in this case, and is at most one. Right? It's always in between one and negative one, and it oscillates forever. Okay. So, okay. If X is positive, right? So if X is a positive number, we know that Um, let's say, well, not even if X is positive, excuse me, here. We know that, okay, so X times sine of one over X is at most X times one, right? Sine of x is always at most one. So x times sine of x is at most x times one. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. So we can even like verify this um, using Julia, for example. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so here we go. And I know that I need to make this bigger. So let me go ahead and zoom in. All right, now I've already uh, imported my necessary packages. So using, oh, my REPL, using plots. Okay, so, one quick and easy way to um, view plots or view functions uh, with plots.jl is to just plot what's called an anonymous function. So I can say plot x and then do dash right caret x times sine of 1 over x. If I run that, you'll see a plot. Okay, so I want to, 
I'm curious about x going to zero. So I'm going to limit my x limbs to be around zero. So I'm going to just press up and then I'm going to change my x limbs. I'll say zero to 0.25. Okay, so that's what it looks like from zero to 0.25. That's in fact, I should probably give it the the name. So name one is equal to x sine of one over x in strings like this. And then I can now plot and give it that label. Label equals name one. So I imagine I'm going to use that over and over again. So where'd it go? Here it is. Okay. So here is my plot. So now let's look at, what did we just say? That um, x sine of x is at most x. Okay. So now I can use plot exclamation mark to plot over this figure. And now I'm going to plot x goes to x. And the x limbs are already set here. I just got to give it a new label. Label equals just x. So we can see that this function x times sine of x is no more than x, right? The red line is x, blue line is x times sine 1 over x. And we see that that function is no more than that. Okay. Um, so, okay. Going back to what we know here, right? If x, is, x times sine of x is no more than x, what do you think I can bound it below by? Right? Sine is at most one and at least negative one. So, what do you think I can put here? Negative one? Negative one times x, right? So just negative x, right? X times sine of x is at most x times one, and x times sine of x is greater than or equal to x times negative one. So going back to uh, my REPL. Let's see what happens when we um, do negative x. So plot with an exclamation mark, x, right arrow, negative x. I'll give that the label negative x. Now we can see that negative x is bounding it from below, right? So visually, we're kind of verifying that we've got some bounds here, right? Now, this is not the full function, though. This is just for um, positive values of x. So now I'm going to go back and I'm going to change my original plot. I'm going to go, OK. Notice that I'm going to call the plot function without the exclamation mark. What that's going to do is it's going to create a new figure. And I'm going to change my x limits now to be negative. 0.25 to 0.25. Okay. See, now we have the negatives too. Okay. And then I'm going to plot x and negative x, and let's see what happens. So this is plot x and then plot negative x. And again, I'm just pressing up on my arrow keys to quickly get back to old uh, lines of code. Okay. Now, I have to ask you now, okay, is sine of x always at most the red line? Over here, it definitely is. Sine of x never gets higher than the red line. But what about over here? Like for negative values of x, is, is x sine of x bounded above by x? It's no. bounded by negative x? It's bounded by negative x. You see that, right? Bounded above by negative x. It's not bounded by x anymore. Oh, this function is bounded. If x is positive, it's bounded by x. 
if x is negative, it's bounded by negative x. What function is that? Like I'm, I'm saying bounded from above in this case, I'm focusing on above. So if x is positive, it's bounded above by x. If x is negative, it's bounded above by negative x. What function would do that? It's a piecewise function I talked about last week. This is what I'm looking for, this shape here. I'm not sure. Um, it's the absolute value of X. Remember how I wrote down the formal definition of the absolute value? It's X if X is positive and it's negative X if X is negative. So right. let's go ahead and look at that now. So I'm gonna press up a bit, plot my sine function again. And then now I'm gonna plot on top of that with the exclamation mark, X goes to absolute value of X. And I'll give it the label absolute value. And the exclamation mark just creates another line or color for it. The so the without the exclamation mark, it makes this figure here. And then the exclamation mark is going to modify the figure. It's going to draw on top of it. So notice how we've already drawn our, our first function, x times sine of x. Now I want to draw absolute value on top of it. So to do that, I just call plot with the exclamation mark. It's gonna modify what's already here. Without the exclamation mark, it makes a brand new figure. All right, so let's run that. Oh, now we see that this function definitely bounds x sine of one over x everywhere, right? From above. Can we take a guess how we could bound it from below? Any guess is a good guess, but the hint is we already, we have something. It looks like if we flip it upside down, we can get a function that bounds it from below. I guess, but the absolute value of negative one would be one, right? So. Right. So how do you flip a function upside down? Yeah. We want to do something to it. Here's our like parent function shown in red and we want to flip it upside down. You multiply it by, what do we multiply it by? Negative. Negative one. So let's like plot now on top of that figure, negative absolute value of X, change my label there. Oh, there's negative absolute value, it bounds it from below. You see that? Now we kind of figured this out um, like graphically, but we could have also figured it out algebraically because if X was negative, all of those signs up there reverse. And then we have two cases and those two cases imply the absolute value. So what we've really shown is that um, negative, absolute value of x is at most x times sine of 1 over x, which is at most absolute value of x. And in the graph, we saw what that looks like. It looks like something like that. There's absolute value of x. There's negative absolute value of x. So then the limit as x approaches zero of negative absolute value of x. So that's like this one here. What's that limit? Zero. Zero, right? And does that equal the limit as x approaches zero of the absolute value of x? Yes. Yeah. So that holds 
And these two functions bound this one from above. So this implies that the limit as x approaches zero of x times sine of one over x also equals zero. And that's by the squeeze theorem. Because if these two sides are both going to zero as x goes to zero, then that has to. So it's always bounded from above and from below. Okay. Okay, so this was my quick recording on the squeeze theorem. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop this recording um, and then we'll get started with the next part of the lecture.